a farmer hired a man to come work for him. You know, on a farm, there's always work to be done. And then in the off season, there's even more work to be done getting ready for the next season. So he hired a young man to, to come work for him. He told him the first task that he wanted him to complete was to paint the barn for him. So he got him paint brushes, rollers, paint, all the things you need to paint a barn, set it out for him and said, now I figured it's a pretty good sized barn. This should take you three days to finish. Well, the man got started on it. Next day when he showed up for work said, I was able to finish the barn yesterday. Just got done in one day. What else do you want me to do? I said, wow. Well, the next thing that I got for you is I got a lot of trees that came down in the, in the storms over the last year. I need them chopped up for firewood. And there's, there's a lot. Uh, it's going to take you about four days to get this done. So he sends the young man out with all the tools that he needs. And in a day and a half, to the farmer's amazement, the young man gets all the trees chopped up, split for firewood, and ready to go. So he says, well, man, you're really flying through these tasks. I'm not really ready for any other big jobs. And I know this isn't as much of manual labor is not as hard to do, but the last thing I need you to do for now is I have a large pile of potatoes. And I need you to sort them into three piles for me. I need one for seed potatoes to get ready for next time. Then I need another pile that'll be hog food. And then the third pile, I need the best, nicest, prettiest potatoes that we can sell. It's not a big job at all. It shouldn't take you hardly any time. Well, at the end of the day, the farmer came back, and much to his surprise, the whole pile's still there, and the guy's sitting there with like three potatoes pushed to the side. The farmer says, what happened? What's the matter here? And the guy says, I, I can work hard, but I can't make decisions. <laughs> and isn't that how things go for us pretty often? You can tell me, you know, here is a very difficult job that I want you to complete, Here's the time frame to get it done. Here's the tools you need. Get it done. We'll do that, right? But as soon as you have to start making decisions about how to do stuff, and you got to start figuring it out, it's like, what, what do I do? What if I do it wrong? Well, this, this potato, it's, it's you know, 90% nice, but it's 10% bad. Is that a seed potato or is that a hog potato? What do, what do I do? This one has more eyes than this one. Where pile does that go in? What if I get it wrong? What if the farmer gets... And we, we really overhype making decisions. But aren't decisions just a normal part of life? Don't we make decisions all day long? And is it just me or does it seem like as you go through life, you keep expecting, you keep thinking that these big major life decisions you're getting them behind you, and they should, at some point in time, slow down, but they never do. There's always these big things you've got to figure out, you've got to think through, you have to make decisions on. So what do you do when there's a decision to be made? Often, we only want to make decisions, especially about the big things of life. We want it to already be narrowed down to one clear path, and then we'll decide to do that, which isn't a decision at all. It's already been figured out for us. Or we have this mystical idea of, of this genie God in the sky that will just make things apparent for us, and we just have to do those things. And then we get, or we want to pawn the responsibility of making decisions onto someone else. And there's probably many reasons that we, we have a difficulty with this. For one, we've, I think sometimes we believe that if we can if we can have a decision determined in advance for us, or if we can determine in advance what the one clear thing is, we can free ourselves from suffering and harm. Um, I think sometimes we think that if we can just get God to give us this very clear path, then we're free from all responsibility, and if it goes sideways, we can blame him, not ourselves. Um, it relieves us of the pressure of taking the time of being responsible to get the facts and, and the counsel to make a good decision. Sometimes we're just plain lazy. We don't want to have to do work. But the fact remains that we will all be faced with the decisions every day. We will have decisions that we have to make. So it's great that in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 26, we actually see the Apostle Paul in the middle of making a very large life decision. We get to see how he makes that decision, why he decides what he's going to decide, and, and all that goes with that. So if you would, please turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. And uh, please stand. We're going to read from Philippians chapter 1. To get context, I'm going to start back in verse 19, and I'll read through verse 26. Philippians 1, 19 to 26. 
For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Uh, Jeremy Luchwager, would you please pray as we get started? You may be seated. The first thing that I want you to notice about this passage is that this snapshot of Paul's decision-making process is found within the confines of a Christ-centered life. A lot of times we put the cart before the horse, especially when big things of life come. It's like, you know, all that stuff all you know, about, you know, serving Christ, and all that, that kind of has to get set aside because i got to make a decision. All the things that God is already working in me to do, that's kind of get it set aside. i got to figure this out. Or, for many of us, we're just kind of floating through life. You know, we, we talk the talk, maybe go to church on Sunday, read our Bible every once in a while, and then something big from life comes. And it's like, God, i got to figure this out. And as soon as I figure this out, I'll get serious again. That's not the way it ought to be. And what we see from Paul is he is already in the midst of a Christ-centered life. This whole passage, everything we've already looked at in, this, in Philippians 1, talking about the difficulty that's come up, him being in prison and then the, the craziness of people trying to afflict him even more by proclaiming Christ and make his chains worse. And that doesn't really, I don't get what they're doing there, uh, but they're trying to make things worse. He's in prison, but he knows that whatever happens, whether by life or by death, Christ will be magnified in him. And then he makes this big statement, right? For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you look in your Bibles, most of them, the word is in both of those phrases is probably italicized. That's because it's not really there. Uh, one of the things that they would do in, um, in Paul's language in Greek is they would omit that verb to draw emphasis. So if you read this literally, what it would say is, for to me, to live, Christ, to die, gain. He's making a big, bold statement here. Now, a lot of times when I hear this verse... One of the things about the book of Philippians, there's a lot of these little verses that really sound wonderful, because they are, um, but that we kind of strip out of context. We put them on like, you know, you get a scenery picture with beautiful trees and leaves rustling, and we put the verse on there, and it's very moving. Um, but stripped from their context, they don't always make a lot of sense. They're kind of like, we're going to get in Philippians chapter 4, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, I'm sure we've all heard that verse quoted about him, especially if you play sports because that means that God wants your team to win, while they're in their locker room saying that God wants their team to win because they can do all things through it. Anyways, um, this is one of those verses that often is kind of stripped from the context, pulled aside, and used with very good intentions, but a lot of times the, what it kind of comes to, because it shifts so quickly to die is gain. We move so quickly past that, it, it's used almost as if I hear like people are saying, this life stinks and it's not any good, and therefore death is gain. But he does not devalue his life in any way. He elevates what God is doing in his life, how God is using him by saying, for to me, to live is Christ. And even at that high level, to die is gain, because he says in a couple of verses here, because that's to be with him. So he makes this big statement, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul has a Christ-centered life, a Christ-centered mindset. Apart from that, nothing else really matters, does it? Remember what Jesus said, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What if we make the, the best decisions in this world? 
What if we figure out how to play the stock market better than anybody else? What if we can attain houses and boats and cars and, and all the things that this world values and we look great, we're charitable, we're nice to people? But if we're not honoring Christ, what does it matter? We can't get the cart before the horse. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain, we need to be reminded of who we are of the life to which we've been called. So I want to go through and just walk through several passages just to kind of get our mind um, going and thinking and be reminded of who we are. Um, So let's walk through these together. First, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Verses 25 to 32. I'm sorry, 34. 25 to 34. Jesus says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. That's an easy one, right? Like, we don't do that. It's right there, red letters. So we just, we don't do it, right? Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. That's pretty important. You ever go without a meal? I don't do it very often, but when I do, oh man. And very recently, for the first, I can, I can tell you because it wasn't for religious purposes. Um, I did a full day fast. Um, that was weird. Um, what we eat and what we drink is pretty important. We can't live without it. But Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not this life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to a stature? Remember that one time that you worried and it fixed the problem? Wasn't that great? When has worrying ever really accomplished anything other than gray hairs, ulcers, broken relationships? Yet we do it all the time. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And here it is, but seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. And I love this. This is like one of my favorite verses. I just love how Jesus puts this. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for its day is the own trouble. Don't worry about tomorrow. You've got enough problems today to take care of. And tomorrow is going to add its own things to have going on. So don't worry about all this. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's our aim. That's where we're looking. And that doesn't mean, you know, on like a list, timeline, the first thing you do is seek the kingdom of God. Okay, sought that. Check. Now I can seek these other things. It's saying primarily the big thing, the one thing that encompasses all else. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Again, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. This is one of those passages that I think is important for us to be reminded of. Whenever in the news, the things that are going on, when we, we get so caught up in what are our rights and what do we have the right to do, and those are okay things, but we're reminded that um, we belong to Christ and we are to be slaves to righteousness. It's not about what are our rights, but who are we in Christ? Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 19. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves as uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Is that how we conduct ourselves every day? 
when we're putting our plan together, when we're thinking about all the things we've got to accomplish, do we, do we think of that in the context of we're slaves to righteousness? Let's turn over a few pages to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Present yourself as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice to God. This just makes sense. It's your reasonable service, your rational service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans chapter 14, just a couple pages over, verses 5 through 13. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be both Lord of the dead and the living, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. We do not live for ourselves, we do not live to ourselves, we live for God, we die for God, because we are His. He has ownership. He's the Creator. By the very fact that He made us, He owns us. And then how much more that when Jesus died on the cross, He paid our ransom. That we have been redeemed, we have been bought back. He owns us. He has the rights to everything. Everything that we have belongs to Him and is a gift from Him. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That price being the precious blood of our Savior. We are not our own. We were bought with a price. And the last one, Galatians chapter 2, verses 17 to 21. Galatians 2, 17 to 21. But if we, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found to be sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Again, another passage of, we are not our own. This life that we have is not our life. It's His. And the life that we live, we live by faith. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives through me. I don't know about you, but these are the things I need to be reminded of daily. Because I am old, constantly thinking through, what am I doing today? How am I going to take care of things? How am I going to provide for my family? How am I going to do this? And those are all good things. But it has to be set back in order. That the responsibilities that I have primarily are not because of who I am, but because of who I am in Christ. 
because the responsibility is given to me by God, I am a steward of the things that he has given to me. This life that I have belongs to him, so when things don't go my way, I can't even get upset. It's not mine. It's not like you ever have to drive a company truck. If you ever had to drive a company vehicle, you kind of get that a little bit. Because when you're driving your own car, there's a ding, there's a scratch, a check engine light. You know, how long do we drive our own cars with the check engine light on? How long do you wait to go to your boss when the check engine light comes on in the company truck? because you're not paying for the bill. So you're going to take it to him right away. This life that we have does not belong to us. To live Christ. And before we even get into how we're going to handle ourselves day to day, how we're going to make decisions, because we get so tempted, the the way that we think about things is such, there's just this man-centered way of thinking that seems to be universal wherever religion is involved. Where it's like, I live my life the way that I live it, and then I hope it follows the list of rules that whatever God I say I belong to, I hope it, it lines up with that. Or I'll tweak things a little bit to fit that. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it all belongs to Him. I am His. I belong to Him. I don't live for my own sake. So we have to be reminded of that before we even get into what we do day to day. We have to quit living for ourselves and the things of this world. We have to end this split allegiance where with part of me I serve God, with part of me I serve ourselves. No one can serve both God and mammon. No one can serve two masters. We have to get these affections of ours under control and serve the living and true God wholly. So in that context of the Christ-centered life, saying to live as Christ and to die as gain, in verse 22 we see Paul's crossroad. We see the decision that he is at to make. Verse 22. It says, But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. So Paul's decision here, he's, something's going on. Do I stay or do I go? What am I going to do? I could either depart and be with Christ, is what the pastor is going to get, that that's the decision, I'll depart and be with Christ, or I'll stay here and continue working. Somehow Paul seems to think, and we don't know exactly why, there's a lot of things we could um, guess or or read in and try to figure it out, but Paul seems to think that, that he has some level of participation in this decision. Usually a prisoner, you don't think they're, you know, they're appealing to a judge or whatever. Paul thinks he has the, he has it here. It may be that he, because of their system of appeals, that he's thinking, I can play my cards this way, and I know that if I play them this way, I'll end up going before so-and-so, and and he's going to put me to death. Or maybe I can do this, and I'm more likely to be freed. But whatever it is, Paul is is writing as if he is the decision maker here. So they don't know what I shall choose. Now let's look at how does he he figure out the decision he's going to make. Look at verses 23 and 24. Um... Verses 23 and 24. I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So as you think about making decisions, what is your decision-making criteria? What is it when you hear most people talk? Let's narrow it down even farther. When you hear most people who claim to be Christians, how do they talk about making decisions? What kind of language do they use? Um, I rode with someone on Friday, and they were in their car, and they were saying that they love 99.1. It's their favorite, one of their favorite Christian radio stations. And I thought that's probably um, not so much of a praise of 99.1 as it is speaking of all the other Christian radio stations, because a lot of them are just junk. And they always have this time of day where the DJ has, like, question and answer time, and people are calling in, and you're like, who told this person to give people advice? It's like, what? where did this come from? You know, they're calling in, and they're going to do this really boneheaded thing. And they're like, oh, man, you just... You just got to follow your heart, and it'll never lead you wrong. It's like, that's Jiminy Cricket. That's not even the Bible. What's, what's going on here? Always let your conscience be your guide. I don't know where we come up with some of the stuff that we do. Um, you know, for many, there's this concept of open doors, right? We have this infatuation with doors. And it's like, if God opens a door, I'll go. If God closes the door, I won't go. I loved it. It wasn't even Christian-related, but someone posted this thing on Facebook where it's like, when, you, when there's something you, you need to do and the door is closed... And you're expecting it to be like, hit your knees and pray, or go a different way, or God will, you know, praise God in the alley, or all these different things. They said, reach out and open the door, because that's how doors work. And then close it behind you, because that's polite. 
And it's like, okay, or sometimes the door is locked, so get a key. I, we have this thing with doors that I don't understand. And now part of it I do get, because there is a one Bible passage that talks about that, right? Paul says he's going to Troas, but we actually flip what it says. It says, I went to Troas, and God opened doors to ministry. It doesn't say, God opened doors, so I went. Um, so we flip that and somehow in our mind. We have, I love one, one author that I, that I have read many things from. He used to always say, um, sometimes an open door leads to an elevator shaft. <laughs> just because a door is open doesn't mean you ought to go through it. Um, and again, just because the door is closed, sometimes you, know, you do a little work and you open the door. It's not really always an indication. It can be. Don't get me wrong. It could be, right? If a door, you can't, sometimes you just can't do something. But that's not from Scripture of how we did figure out what we're going to do, whether or not a door is open or closed. Often we want to seek a sign. And we don't, sometimes like we do the silly big things and we're like, God, you know, if this happens, and God could do that, but you ever notice that conversation is very one-sided? I always wondered, how do you know that God was the one that aligned? Just because you said to do it doesn't mean he's got, he has to do it. It's not like, oh man, now I've got to do it for him. Uh, Larry Burkett told the story on his, his radio program of a young couple who, they wanted to buy a house, but they, they had, didn't have the means for it. They knew it was way too expensive, so they got on their knees and they prayed this. God, if you want us to buy the house, number one, have the contractor accept half of the down payment that they're asking for. And number two, have the bank approve our loan. Now, as soon as I read that part, I started thinking through the timeline of the last few years. I'm not sure when he was doing his thing, but if that was, we can all pinpoint probably a five-year time span where the bank approving a loan means nothing. That means nothing. Um, but have them accept this, and, and that happened. So, of course, then what do they think? Oh, God, God wants us to buy this house. So they do. And very soon, um, making the mortgage payments, they couldn't afford the other things they needed. They were snowballing into debt. And then they had this problem, right? Because God wanted them to buy the house. What do we do now? God told us to make this decision, and it's not working out. How, how do you know that God is the one that, that lined those things up for that purpose? A lot of times we deal with feelings, right? What decision feels right? Do I have a feeling of peace about the decision? And that one, I, I, I kind of think is funny because right now, you know, I got four kids, seven and under at home. One more on the way. My wife is miserable all the time because she's pregnant. And it's not like, you know, like that first baby, you sleep more and you take naps and you take care. You can't do that when there's all these little crazy people running throughout your house, opening, we have a one-year-old that just opens drawers and pulls stuff out like the end of the world. Um, so you can't do that. Now for me, I could go out and help. That's not very peaceful. You know what's peaceful? A cup of coffee in my office with the door shut. That was really peaceful. Um, I bet you I could ask every single mother in this room, they would tell me, that's not the right decision. <laughs> Feelings of peace don't mean anything, or we think that we'll have this supernatural presence. And I'm not, you know, again, sometimes that is how it works, but what I'm saying is not an authoritative, it's not a definitive way of making decisions, but we, this is what we do, this is what we put together, we feel, really feel spiritual when we do that. Sometimes we might not feel good about a decision because we ate too much pizza. You know, have you, for those of you that work out, have you ever taken like a pre-workout drink on an empty stomach? You will never feel like working out after that. Doesn't mean you shouldn't work out. These things are not authoritative. And then the biggest one, we have this mysterious, ambiguous idea of this call and will of God, that God has this one thing for us that we have to go chase. And again, I caution you, how do you know for sure? If you're going to use that strong of language, you better know. Because if, if you are saying that something is the will of God for you, you better do it. But a lot of times when hardship comes up, then we say, oh, well, I guess that really wasn't. So just be careful. Say things like, it seems like God is leading this way. It seems like this is what God has for me, rather than I know God is doing this, because we don't have authoritative things in those ways. Um, I love the way John MacArthur put it in one of his little books uh, with people that are always, you know, and it really gets into like that high school and college age are the worst. They're probably the most blunt with it. Probably not the worst isn't the right word, but it's like, I got to find God's will in you, especially if you ever go to a Bible college campus, it's just crazy. <laughs> Because it's like one week, it's God's will for me to marry you. And the next week, it's not God's will for me to marry you. We have to break up. And then the next week, it's God's will for me to marry you. We, it's not good. That's how they make every single decision on a Bible college. I never encountered that until I got to Bible college. I'm like, you're all nuts. 
how, where are you getting this? Because I didn't read in the Bible anywhere where it had that page number where it said this is the person exactly who you're, whatever is going on. And this is something that was shared with me before we get into Paul's exact criteria that I think is extremely helpful and puts things in the right perspective. You know, whenever there's a decision coming up, it's hard to kind of see those X's. There's, a, there's usually a lot of options, right? And the best thing to do when something's coming up is first, that box represents what does God's word clearly say about the decision? So, got to feed your family, and you're in the store, and you left your wallet at home, but the guy behind you has a wallet, very clear from scripture you're not supposed to beat him over the head and take his wallet. When God's word speaks clearly about it, that's case closed, right? We know we don't crawl, we, these are out of the picture now. Then how does God's word indirectly speak about it? And that's really where Paul is here. Um, the, the criteria that he uses fulfill so many scriptural commands that don't directly deal with whether or not you handle your court case or whether you go to Philippi. But once we get inside that box, there's a reason there's so much scripture that talks about wisdom and seeking counsel. Because God does not work in this way where he always narrows it down to one thing to where we are resolved of all responsibility. We are still required to make decisions. And there's a level of freedom within that. If we are obeying what God has said, we are living in this context, again, of we are living a Christ-centered life, as, as we are seeking him, we are pursuing him, he'll often work within our desires in that case. Not always. But going through that grid helps narrow it down to a place to where we can make a right decision and make sure that we're handling things as scripturally as possible. So what are Paul's criteria here? Um, he, he really lines it up. There's different things. He has two different choices, right? To live or to die. He says to live is Christ. To live means fruitful labor. And it's necessary for the Philippians. But look at his list on to die. Because I think for most of us, if we had this list, we would choose differently. It says to die is gain, right? Christ, gain. It satisfies his desire. Look at the, back in the passage again. Um, some hard press between the two having a desire to depart and be with Christ. He's desiring a really good thing, right? Desires to be with Christ. And then he even says it's far better. It's very much better. Now, this is actually written, this is a very redundant statement. To, to really say this correctly, we'd have to be like, it's very much more better. A really bad grammar. But he's saying it's far better to be with Christ. There, there is nothing better than to be with Christ. And I would think with that criteria, you'd pick the, the right. But then look at verse 24. I mean, sorry, number 25. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you. So how did Paul value this? How did Paul walk through this? When I took the, the a class in the book of Philippians, um, this little, I know my teacher didn't come up with this, but they repeated it and didn't say who did. So I always think of this with Charles Wagner. Um, it's called the formula for joy that they, they bring out of the book of Philippians. Joy is Jesus, others, you. Paul is already living a Christ-centered life, Jesus. To live is Christ. But he's putting the emphasis on others. It's not what can I gain about this, what's in it for me. It's I can serve you. I can have fruitful labor for you. And the fruit doesn't even come back to Paul. It's not like he's planting a tree and he gets to eat of the fruit. The benefit entirely goes to the Philippians. Now, I, in case you haven't figured it out, we are living in a time where everything you know is wrong. And every time you think of a way to fix the thing that you know is wrong, that's wrong too. Um, with all the open letters and the, the people that would have never had a voice and a platform to speak before, everything is wrong. And every way you want to fix it is wrong. So, of course, I, I plugged this thing. So I was trying to figure out who was the first person to come up with it. And, of course, I got all these like, hateful things of, this is why this is the worst thing ever. And Christians say dumb things. But th there was one that made a really good point. There, there is a way we can take these things, and they're meant to be simple reminders and easy reminders. And we make them super complicated. So this pastor talked about people in his church that run themselves ragged, trying to order their lives this way, like on paper and very physically and planned out. And it's like, so I have to do my devotions until I get that special tingly feeling inside. So that runs for three hours until I finally feel like I did enough. So now my kids, I can't get them breakfast before they get to school. So I got to rush them out of the house. And I can't, I really need to take my medicine and take a shower, but I can't do that because I haven't spent enough time on other, and we like make every, Keep it simple. 
The focus of our life is first and foremost, we serve Christ. But then we value and we revel in those opportunities to serve other people. To live for the sake of serving others rather than meeting my own desires. It still means we take care of ourselves in the way that we ought to. Our body, again, is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which we have from God. And since this body belongs to him, we are a steward of it, so we ought to take care of ourselves and to do the things that are right that way. But in the, we need, in the right order. And then often there's a lot of times in life where we're put in a place where we have to put other people's desires and, and what's good for others above what we want to do. And all the parents said, yep. Um, Paul makes his decision based on the good of others. How can I serve you? What can I do? Rather than his own desires. The provil- ability to provide for the Philippians is the deal breaker's deal breaker for the Apostle Paul. And then look at the consequences of what this is going to mean now in verse 26. Verse 26, the Apostle Paul says, um, actually, let's go back to 25. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and joy of faith. So he wants to see them progress in faith, have that joy that comes from serving the Lord, and that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. And that, where it says you're rejoicing for me, um, that includes a lot of interpretation. What the actual word is, it's actually boasting. He actually says that you're, every other time this word is used, it's boast. This is the only time it's translated as rejoicing. And I can, we can understand why, right? Because we don't like that word boast. It makes us feel like we're doing something wrong. But he's not talking about boasting about themselves, but boasting in the Lord. This, and that's where that idea then rejoicing does come in, that look at all that God is doing. God has... Free, and the hope here is that God, they'll be able to say, God has freed the Apostle Paul and brought him to us, that God would strengthen us, that he would give us progress in the faith and the joy that we now have together. As we think through this passage, the first and clear thing again is we have to get things back in order. We live for Christ. We belong to him. It's all for him and his glory. We can follow the Apostle Paul's example and then cherish those opportunities to serve one another. And this gets into all matters of life. It's not compartmentalized. I, I, this week, again, Riley was in the hospital. And I had to remind my, I was you know, studying for my sermon, and I had to remind myself, okay, yeah, you're here as Riley father, but, Riley's father, but you are here as Christ's property. You are here as his servant. And even in this situation, you can't set aside those things and be like, I'm going to focus on getting the right things for my daughter. You focus on getting the right things done for your daughter in the context of being a servant. And the jobs that we have, one of the pastors that we met with recently put it perfectly. His wife's a nurse. And he said, isn't it wonderful that that this hospital pays you to be Christ's representative here? Because even though you have a job to do and you better do that job, you better do it well for the glory of God, first and foremost, you're an ambassador for Christ here. You're the property of Christ doing this job. In all matters of life, we belong to him, and we should seek to serve others. When we go to the McDonald's and they mess up our cheeseburger, we're not just the disgruntled customer that didn't get what we want. We're still the ambassador of Christ. That person is still a person made in Christ's image. They're not just a piece of property of the store that we trample on. When I do my job, when I wake up in the morning, when I'm resting, everything that we do, we belong to Christ. The interactions that we have with each other, we have the opportunity to serve each other. And how often do we not even realize that? Friday I had one of those days where I had like, I woke up and I knew what I was going to do that day. I had had two things in the morning and in the evening planned. I was going to go help someone in the morning and I was like, let's take an hour, three hours. Um, Then at night someone was coming over, we were going to hang out, have a good time. Well, I got up, I got to the person's house, that took three hours, like I said. There's things I didn't know that they knew um, that it was going to be longer, and I didn't know about these things that they didn't let me know about. So um, that took three hours. But that's an opportunity to serve someone for three hours. Of course, I didn't necessarily think about that the whole time um, until later. And I was like, duh, you just, that was a good thing. Well, then someone called me, and I, and I misunderstood. I thought they were, like, on their lunch break, and we were going to go for, like, really quick into the store and buy something and come back. Um, but that took, I think, four hours when all was said and done. So it was like we, we drove over to Missouri and we went shopping and then we went to the store that didn't have the thing they needed and then so we had to go to another one and then we had to come back over here and all centers around the silliness of Illinois law when all is said and done. But 
Um, that took four hours. So I had like woke up, ran to someone's house for three hours, got home, did something really quick, then went with the other person for four hours, went to the gym real fast, and then picked up dinner and we had dinner with some folks. But we could get mad. How often do we get upset with days like that? Oh, it didn't go the way I wanted it to. Not your life. Um, and we didn't get the tasks done that we meant to. But God gives us an entire day of serving others to be exactly where he meant for us to be in that moment, to serve people with the love of Christ. And we just miss it. We are so short-sighted that we can't even catch what's going on around us. So again, this is a passage that causes us to sit back and reflect first. What am I living for? Who am I living for? Is my life actually characterized by service of others? How is that reflected in the decisions that I make? Do, do I really serve others, or is it just that time when I get my name on the schedule to do something? Do I live a life of service to others, even in the non-traditional forms of service? I urge you to take time preparing for this week and think that through. Look ahead at what's, what you know is coming up, because we don't always know what's going to come up. But be, in, but be preparing to serve the Lord. Evaluate if you are living for him or for self. And that's always going to be, to some extent, a mix of both, as we are constantly dying to self to, to, to live for the Lord. But look through the week that you have. How do you have opportunities to serve people? Where has God positioned you so that you can serve others? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. God, I just thank you for how practical this passage is. God, I just ask that this week you would work within your people. God, just cause us to love you even more. Lord, that as your son said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And God, please let that be the case. The different things of this life and this world that we come to love, adore, and worship to a place that isn't right, God, I pray that you would remove those. Lord, that you would lift our eyes onto you and just draw us close that we would love and serve you. And Lord, your son said that the second command is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And God, we know that if we're not loving our neighbor, if we're not loving others, we're not loving you. You said that in your word. We can't hate our brother and love you. God, I pray that you would work within us that we would be truly servants of one another. That we would value and long for opportunities to serve other people to show the love of Christ, to challenge each other in our faith, to encourage each other. God, I pray for our church, for Community Bible Church, that we would be a church full of joy because of who you are and what you're doing in our lives. But God, even our interactions with each other would cause us to just be a people of great joy. And God, that in this way, we would be a bright, shining light to this world that they would see what it truly means to be a son and daughter of the king. God, we love you, and we pray that you would be honored in these things. In Jesus' name, amen.